Yeah, so this morning, just before I start, I was just standing here in worship and just reminded of um, 15 years ago in 2009. That's when I got saved and I gave my life to Jesus. And you know, some, I was standing here so grateful and just thinking, how, what do I know now more than I knew then? And, and this one thing came to mind is that I need His grace now more than ever. More than I needed it then, I need His grace continually. We sometimes think, yeah, we need the grace of God, we get saved, and then we're okay. Then we can, can be fine for the rest of our lives. We, we got our ticket booked in heaven, it's fine. Let's be seated for the rest of the journey. But we need the grace of God continuously. And um, I think something of that is going to come through this, this morning's message as well. But I've titled the message, Find Your Growth Zone. Find your growth zone. And uh, one thing is sure is God wants us to be mature Christians. God wants us to grow. God wants us to continually grow. God doesn't want us to stagnate and be the same and uh, think we're okay. But um, I'm going to start off this morning by reading a scripture from Acts 27. And I think we can, you can turn your Bibles to Acts 27 if you've got your Bibles with you or your app or your phone or whatever you use. Acts 27, and it's a portion of Scripture where Paul is on the boat, on the ship, on his way to, well, to Rome. But before we do that, just as we open our Bibles, let's pray and we lift up the word. Thank you, Jesus, for your incredible word. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of having your word, which is life to us. And Lord, we desperately need your grace. We desperately need your empowering, your equipping, your your mercy and grace, Lord Jesus. May we never be found without it. This morning, just reading in, in Psalm 39, may our hope be found in you, Lord Jesus. Our hope is in your word, Lord Jesus, which is steadfast and eternal. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, we're going to be reading Acts 27, verse 13 to 14. And I've just got it in the Amplified here, so in your, in your version translation, you might see it differently. And it says, so when the south wind blew softly, supposing they were obtaining their objective, some translations they speak about the wind blew softly, so they, they saw the opportunity and they took it. And they, they weighed anchor and they sailed along Crete, hugging the coast. And I love the amplified version here. It says they were sailing close to the coast. They were hugging the coast. You can see they, they staying on the safe side because you never know what can go wrong. But verse 14, but the weather changed abrupt, abruptly, suddenly. A wind of typhoon strength, the northeaster they called it, caught the ship and blew it out to sea. How many of you know that storms come suddenly? <laughs> we don't always expect them, but they come suddenly, they, they, they're just there. And you know, if, if we knew they were coming, we would probably prepare differently. We would, we would do things differently if we knew they were coming. But you know, one moment you're hugging the coast, you're safe, and the next moment you're blown out to sea. That's the way it happens. The storms in life, the, the trials of life come that way. We don't expect them. One moment we, we're happy-go-lucky, we're safe, we're, the sun is shining, and all of a sudden, boom, something bad at work happens. The doctor gives us bad news. The, uh, a bad deal goes wrong. Uh, relationships crumble around us. Storms of life happen. And I think we find ourselves ill-equipped to handle it sometimes because we think, but I'm born again. It should go well with me. And then I think that's one of the things that, that is, um, that's wrong with, there's a, like a Christian problem in the world with, call it, some call it the, the prosperity type gospel where there's this, this misdirected untruth about the gospel where it's all about me and my needs and my comfort. And it, there's something wrong with that because it's not the way God designed it. And it's a gospel that's mis, that is, has a misunderstanding and a, I want to say a disregard for the trials and the, the sufferings and the storms that life throws at us. It's a gospel that says everything should be smooth sailing. But as we see in the story of Paul, everything is not always smooth sailing. 
And do we have a theology, a hope, that is secure enough to take us through the storm? Through those times where life hits you from the, from the left and you weren't expecting it. See, Jesus didn't say, follow me and we'll have a smooth sailing. <laughs> if he did, life would be very different. But, but, you know, I think part of the problem there is also, we think because we have faith in Jesus, because we follow Jesus, God owes me something. God owes me something and he has to give me my health. He has to give me my, my, my needs. He has to provide for me. And I'm not saying God doesn't want to. God wants to. But it's not because God owes me that. And that's something we need to have settled because we miss out on the vital necessity that, that we have to live out, work out our salvation with, with, with reverence, with awe, with this, with this yeah, laying down before Jesus. That's the way we need to live out our salvation. Um, and I wrote here, we need to constantly dethrone ourselves and enthrone God, enthrone Christ in his rightful place in my life. There's this constant struggle in our lives. It's the process of me becoming more like Christ where I dethrone myself, less of me, and in the same process I'm enthroning Christ. I love that. That, that, that dichotomy of the one happens at the same time the other one happens. But we've got this problem of the fallen human nature. And maybe not you, but in me, that fallen human nature is so alive. It loves its comfort and convenience. I don't know about you, but me, hey man, we, we like the comfort. We don't like storms always. But it's the very opposite of what kingdom sacrificial living is all about. Kingdom sacrificial living. Sacrificing our lives daily. And that's a concept that is tough to hear. And I think it's a concept that is, it sounds so big and out there. It's not relevant to me, you might say. But this morning I'm trusting that we can break it down and make it like practical handles of how do I live out my sacrificial kingdom living? How do I do that practically? So uh, Paul was on his way to Antioch in Acts 14, verse 22. And it says, he went around strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. So he was going around encouraging the guys. And this was his encouraging message. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. How encouraging is that? <laughs> yeah, I you know, we, we don't often see this on wedding cards or birthday cards, like, hey, hope your year is great, many hardships for the kingdom. We don't see that. Maybe in my next wedding card we need to write that one in. Hey. But, but you know, this was encouraging for, for Paul. He was, he was preparing them for the storms of life and saying, be encouraged. There might be storms, there might be hardships, but you've got the grace to go through this. And you know, the, the whole of the Old Testament it's there for a reason. We know the Old Testament is there for a reason, but we, we constantly see the sacrifices that they made to, to, to God. And we might think back and say, oh, that's just religious acts that they were doing. But no, the sacrifices that they made towards God was their act of worship to God. And there's this, this thing that happened where they brought the, the, the blood of goats and bulls and animals as a sacrifice in a trade-off for their life. And they realize as they bring the sacrifice, it's an act of worship because they remember, God, that animal had to die so that I could have life. How thankful I am, God, that you, you made a way for animals to take my place. But we know from Hebrews uh, as well that it's impossible for the blood of goats and bulls to take away our sins for always. We know that it was temporary back then, but Hebrews 10 verse 10 also says, And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That thing settles it so much in our heart. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice once for all, for everybody. And when I read that, I know that, you know, it's a perfect sacrifice. Nothing can improve the sacrifice Jesus made. Nothing can add to the atonement he already paid for. It was perfect. Nothing can be added. 
Why am I saying that? Because it comes to me that, you know, any sacrifice, however big or small I make, cannot add to the atonement that Jesus already made. Nothing I say, I might think, whoa, you know, Jesus, whew, I, I prayed for the sick at the eye clinic. What a sacrifice. I'm adding to your atonement. We might think that way. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. No, that, that was done. So why, if Jesus paid it all, he was the perfect sacrifice, why do we still need to live a sacrificial life? <laughs> Good question. Why do we still need to sacrifice? Not bulls and goats. I think we all gather that that's not the sacrifice we're talking about. It's living our lives as sacrificial lives. But why do we still do need to live sacrificial lives if it's not adding anything to what Jesus has done? Romans 12 verse 1 encourages us. It says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true, proper worship. I need to live a sacrificial life because it's worship towards God. It's my true and proper worship to God. It's pleasing to God. I want to please God. Not because I have to, because He's worthy of it. I want to worship God true and proper. Not because I have to. Not because it's a law. But because I owe Him everything. It's a reminder that my sacrifice, doesn't matter how big or small, it's an act of worship. It's it's giving God glory, and our living should be honoring God and displaying His glory more and more to the outside world. More and more people should be looking at our lives and saying, wow, I see Jesus is glorified through that. You know, in the, in the same way, we, we lay down our lives with sacrificial lives. We lay down our ways and we take up His way. We dethrone ourselves and we enthrone Him. We take up His, uh, we lay down our will and we take up His will because His will is so much more important than my will. Constantly, we want to be transformed. And this process, the sanctification process, does not happen in comfort and convenience. <laughs> How many of you know that? We, we all have been in seasons, maybe you're still in a season comfort. Maybe you don't even know you're in a season of being in a comfort zone or comfortable. But, but this growth, this process, this, this honoring God sacrificially doesn't happen in comfort and convenience. Uh, 1 Peter 2 verse 5. Peter encourages the church there. It says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Everybody included, the holy priesthood, everybody included, says offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What's the thing that makes my sacrifice acceptable to God? It's only through Jesus Christ. Nothing I do, you know, it has to go through Jesus Christ, and that makes it acceptable. However big or small it is, whatever I think I'm doing, I want it to be pleasing to God. And that's why I want to do it with Jesus, through Jesus, with Jesus in me, with Jesus with me. That's the way we want to do things. And it doesn't matter the small things. Don't despise if it's small acts. It doesn't matter how big or small it is. If it's in, in, with the right heart and towards God, it's going to be pleasing to Him. We often get... In my mind, I see it this way. We often get so overwhelmed if a task is too big that we'd rather just not do it at all. And we just back off totally. But when we can break it down into small, reachable, doable steps, then we're like, well, but, but I, I can do that one thing. And that's what Jesus desires of us. There's a guy called J.C. Ryle. He had this uh, quote. He said, Souls are perishing, time is flying. Let us resolve, by God's grace, to do something for God's glory before we die. And that word something stood out for me like anything. Let us do something for God's glory before we die. And I don't know about you, what's your something? 
What's my something? What's the something that I've got to do for God's glory? And you know, it's not always the thousands and reaching the millions. And it's not, that, that's again, if we think about the big task, we're going to think, no, Jesus, that's for the super spiritual. That's for the leaders. That's for them, not for me. And our fingers point outwards and we're not saying, Lord, what about my something? God's more concerned about my heart and the impact I can have in my immediate surroundings, in my area that I'm in. Something doable, something reachable. You know, and that's the, the thing is, I, if I do one small thing, one small step, and I do that in obedience like, Lord, this one small step, it's going to build my faith to take a next step next time. And maybe the next step is a little bit bigger than the previous one. And the next one might be even a little bit bigger than the, the previous one. And eventually we find ourselves running in the things of God and we don't even thinking of the small task, big task, we're just saying, what next? You know the movie Gladiator? Incredible movie, everybody knows it. Hopefully, if you haven't watched it, gap in your life. But imagine I say to you this morning, you have to make a movie like the Gladiator. Go and make the movie. I mean, whoa. First of all, it's a good movie. I don't think I can do it. Where am I going to start? I don't even know. And that's the overwhelming part. Like, where do I even start? But what if I told you, we're making a movie. Carl, won't you just hold the mic for us, please? Or like, Vainant, won't you just hold the light for us? We need light on that scene. Um, one of my patients, I remember, he was a location scout for movies. And months before the movie was, was uh, started shooting even, he would go around looking for locations where to shoot movies. Like they would say, we want a movie in a canyon, a scene in a canyon. And he would go around looking for places where they can shoot the movie. He was a location scout. Once the movie starts shooting, he's not even in the picture anymore. His only job was to find a location. What if you are asked to only find a location? That's doable. One step that's doable, and, and all together we can make this movie work. You know, we do so well in church to speak kingdom, to speak let's go for the nations, let's reach nations, we need to be the church advancing the kingdom. And that is good talk, but that's talk that somebody is scared of something. If I say let's go advance the kingdom of God, it's true, but you might think, woof, where do we start? What's your something that you can break down and say, this is my part to play? You see, impacting the nations, advancing the kingdom, is comprised of a whole lot of small, doable, achievable things. And his vehicle that God chose to use is the church of God, the church of Christ. He's chosen the church to comprise of a whole lot of different people made from different nations, tribes, tongues, colors, gifts, whatever, like, some can sing, some can't. Some can dance, some can't. And together, he's chosen for each one to do a little bit of a task that comprises together of advancing the kingdom. And yes, God wants us to step out into the nations. God wants us to go to the nations. When we do that, something in our hearts breaks open because we realize God wants to do more in us and through us. And we, we get the context of what, how God wants to reach the nations, and we can bring that back to encourage others to do the same. Hebrews 13, verse 16. Such an incredible, practical verse. It says, And do not forget to do good and to share with others. Just think, when lost, do you feel that you do good? <laughs> Just a small challenge. When lost, did did I do good? When last did I share with others? Don't forget to do good and to share with others. For such sacrifices, God is pleased with. Such sacrifices. Like, I'm not reading there, convert a million people. I'm not reading there, do preach to a thousand people. I'm not reading that there. I'm simply reading, don't forget to do good and don't forget to share with others. God is pleased with sacrifices like that. 
That is sacrificial living. And you know, that word sacrifice, it implies a cost. It will cost me something. I wrote here, my something will cost me something. But not doing something will cost me everything. And it impacts me because we, we, we get so overwhelmed with the big things, we forget to do the small things, and we, we end up doing nothing. We end up not doing my something. And it end up costing us everything. You see, it might cost my, me giving some of my belongings to someone in need. It might cost me my time, a little bit of my time, to go pray for somebody. And I wrote here, pray for the sick, pray for the sad, pray for the hurting, and pray for those celebrating. Why do we always link prayer for each other with just the sad, healing, hurting part? Why don't we just pray for each other more when somebody, there's a new addition to the family, we pray for them, bless them. Somebody has a new adventure, a new, a new house, a new job. We pray for them. We celebrate with them. It might cost me time because I have to go celebrate with them. It might cost me my skills and my gifts for the sake of the community in the church. It might, might cost me my service serving somebody for, for the sake of blessing somebody else. It might cost me to take a step of faith, to risk a little, to go into the area of risk, for the sake of impacting another person next to me, maybe even impacting the city, maybe even, dare we say, impacting the nation. There's a cost involved. You know what David said? David wanted to give a, a sacrifice to God and, and a king wanted to give him the, the land and the oxen and everything. And David replied to him, No, I insist on paying you for it. 2 Samuel 24 verse 24 says, I will not sacrifice to the Lord, my God, burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David understood something of sacrificial living. Like, Lord, if I'm sacrificing this thing to you, it has to cost me something. Because I have to feel, Lord, this is, this is me laying down something of me, costing me something so that I can worship you proper and true. I can give you the... the the, the honor and the glory that you so deserve. If sacrificial living is costing us nothing, then we have to question our hearts. You know, uh, a guy said once, uh, your growth zone is outside of your comfort zone. I think that's the key thing for us, is, is if we want to find our growth zone, if we want to grow in, in God, we need to know that it's not going to happen in our comfort zone. It has to happen with me taking a step outside of that. And however difficult it might feel, don't think of where you want to end. Think of just the one step you want to start. That one step we take out of that circle of comfort. And once we're there, it's going to feel unsecure, it's going to feel risky, it's going to feel weird. And then once we stumble across to the next step, we're going to learn this new thing. We're going to learn something new about God, about ourselves. And I remember these circles with our identity as the circles are moving ever closer over each other. We stumble into more of what God sees about us, knows about us. Sacrificial living. Small, doable, achievable steps towards growth. There's an unknown author that, that had this quote. Yo. Standing in your pain is no easier than taking steps to move ahead. The comfort zone was never intended to be a place for us to build permanent foundations. And it, it's so true because standing in your pain, we think it's, it's so painful. I think that word that, that, that Devin had this morning of just like a festering wound. You know, we, we maybe feel like we've got that wound. And it's so much easier to just remain in the comfort zone where we are because it's easier. We think it's easier, but it's really not easier. Maybe that one step, taking that one step out of that comfort, asking somebody for prayer, stepping out, that might be difficult, but it's not more difficult than staying in that way. Permanent foundations is not meant to be built in our comfort zone. You know, our maturity and growth, it has to happen outside of that. We have to take that step. And, you know, taking those steps, it can be and it will be uncomfortable. 
but it will be so worth it. And it's not just worth it, it is doable, it is achievable by the grace of God. We need the grace of God to help us with those things. You know, what does the grace of God mean? It means it's His undeserved goodness towards us that empowers us to take every step. It's like, you don't deserve this, but I'm going to give you the energy and the power and the grace that you just take that one step. And once you do, I'm going to give you even more power empowering so that you can take one more step. One more step. And there's like, if we think about it, we, we, got, we, we settle for the comfort that we're in now, but we're missing out on the eternal comfort that we're going to have one day. There's an eternal comfort. Why would we want comfort now if we know we're going to work for our eternal comfort? God will help us move out of that. Just maybe in ending, I want to read Luke 5, verse 1 to 7. You can open your Bible to Luke 5. And, um, you know, growing is not always easy. And it's challenging. And maybe like this, this morning, I'm trusting it would be like Paul's words in Acts 14 as well. It would be encouraging, but it's also challenging. Because if we're not challenged, we're not going to want to step out of any convenience or comfort. But in Luke 5, we, we get the, the story where Jesus is by the lake of Gennesaret. And, and he's seeing his disciples, or, well, by then they weren't his disciples yet, but he saw the, the boat there. And verse 2 says, he saw the, by the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. So you imagine this picture. Jesus is walking on the shore. He sees these two boats just on the shore there in the shallow water. And he sees the fishermen washing their nets. Now, I don't know about you, but a, a boat in the shallow water is not going to catch any fish. Okay? And nets on ground is also not going to catch any fish. And it might be a good idea to wash your nets every now and again, but it's not where we're going to be catching any fish. And then Jesus got into one of the boats uh, that belonged to Simon. He asked him to put it a little off to shore, off from shore, and he sat there and he taught the people from the boat. And then verse 4, it says, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now put out into deep water. He's say, saying to Peter, Go out deeper, Simon. Go out deeper and lay down your nets for a catch. And, and I think that's one of the calls, one of the commands, one of the encouragement Jesus has got for us. Is too many of us have been maybe playing in the safe, shallow shore. Too many of us has been washing our nets, preparing our nets. And I just feel God's encouraging us, go deeper. Go deeper, go throw out your nets. Go throw out your nets. You know, ships are safe in harbors, but ships are not made for harbors. Ships are made for the open sea. Ships are made to be out there. Maybe good for a season to be in the harbor, get some replenishment, some new stock, some, some repairs. But then once we're ready, we need to be heading out again, deeper water. Verse uh, 6, I think. Yeah. Verse 5, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. Now, many of us would have exactly the same answer that, like that. And our answers might vary a, vary a bit, eh? But, but maybe we say to Jesus, like, Lord, I've been working a little hard, eh? I'm tired. Or maybe Jesus, I've, I haven't seen the results, so I, I'm not really keen to try again. Or maybe, like, you don't know what's happening between me and my wife. Like, and you don't know what, what, what's happening at work. You don't know how my budget is looking. You don't know, I don't have any leave left. I don't have any time to go and do this. Think of all the excuses. Let's get it out. All the excuses. But when we've had all the excuses and we lay those before Jesus, may we answer what Peter then answers, or what Simon then answers. He says, but because you say so, I will lay down the net. In spite of all our excuses about why we, we don't want to. 
May we answer Jesus in that same way and say, but Lord, because you say so, I want to do that. There's this call for us to, to, like those fishermen, become fishers of men in different ways, in small, doable ways, one step at a time. And you know what these fishermen did? They left their stuff. They followed Jesus. And they, they left the comfort of what they knew, which was fishing. They were very good fishermen. They left the comfort of the fishing, and they followed Jesus. That's such an incredible picture of somebody willing to leave behind the comfort and just go into something unknown, something they, they are not comfortable with. But what happened? They, one step at a time, learned from Jesus, sat with Jesus, ministered with Jesus. And in the end, we see those disciples rock, rocking the whole world, changing the world upside down through the simple gospel, sharing one step at a time. One town at a time. We read the book of Acts and we see them just sharing the gospel, spreading out one by one. So this morning, you might question yourself. What's your comfort zone? What's your reason? What's your excuses? But I would rather encourage us to say, just ask yourself, what's your something? What's your something that you have to do to give God glory? through that. And what's your deeper? Because my deeper is different than your deeper. (laughs) Let's not all think it has to be the same deep. Yeah, you know, many, many might have been through storms and trials. Many of us might feel like we're still in a storm. But I just believe God wants to to give us a, a hope and a security in who He is, in the small steps that he wants us to get through the storm, the suddenlies. He wants us to get through that. So. I, don't, I didn't add this one, but I, I, I just want to add Luke 5. I think it's a little bit further down, verse 37, where it just speaks about the new wine into old wines. And you say, you say, they say that you don't add it into old wineskins, otherwise the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. Then it says, no, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. I just feel God wants to encourage us to not get stuck in swimming in the old wine. Do not get stuck there. God wants us to to get the new wines. And if we want the new wine, we have to stop being the old wineskin. (laughs) We can't have both. We can't be the old wineskin and want the new wine. He's saying to us, we have to stop drinking old wine, stop being the old wineskins, and then we have to desire the new wine that he wants to give. What's your something? Let's close our eyes. Yeah, Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for your incredible, incredible presence and your love this morning. That we go through this room that you know each and every single one. You know each one of our hearts. You know what we go through. You know the storms, you know our shallow waters, you know our flaws and our faults. And in spite of that, you love us, you cheer for us. Wow, Lord, you desire the best for us. Lord, I want to thank you that this morning we would would realize that there's more out there for us. When we take one step of obedience towards you, Lord Jesus, Lord, I want to pray that there's this almost this shaking in our hearts that, that we don't want to remain in, in comfort and convenience. Lord, I want to pray that we, we, we run after you. But if we have to start with one small step, I pray that we do.
Now, just, just thinking of that word again that Devon shared. If there's anybody that even remotely feels like you've got that festering wound, Jesus is wanting to, to work in our hearts this morning. Maybe you feel like your, your, your footing has been shaken and you feel so insecure. Maybe God is wanting us to feel so insecure in our comfort zones that we want to step out into more. And if you feel this conviction in your heart, I pray that as, that as the Holy Spirit does something like that, it's pressing on our hearts, a conviction in our hearts, he burdens this question in our hearts. Lord, I've heard this. I know this. But what next? What do you desire for me to do? So many of us maybe are waiting for God to speak. But maybe God is waiting for us to step out. And as we step out, God speaks more. Thank you, Jesus, for your incredible word. Thank you for your Holy, Holy Spirit that wants to walk alongside us. Jesus, you're calling us deeper. Thank you, Jesus, that you didn't call us to do this alone, that you've given us this church this home, this safe space, that as we can speak brother to brother, priesthood to priesthood, that we can encourage one another, that we can do good to one another, we can share with one another. Lord, I pray for a breaking of our hearts for more of you, breaking of our hearts for more for other people, Lord Jesus. As we dethrone ourselves, Lord Jesus, may we have a heart more for other people, May we enthrone you in our, in, in our lives to the rightful place, Jesus Christ. And maybe this morning you, you, you've never even heard this or feel you've given your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never made Lord Jesus Lord in your life. And you want to respond now. Say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to be like the fisherman that leaves, a, leaves behind the fishing net and follows you, Lord Jesus. That's you. you. You can respond. Lord, in our hearts, we all want to respond. We can just say, Lord, take us deeper so that we can throw out our nets. And you know the end result of that story? They threw in their nets and it was so much fish, they couldn't handle it alone. They had to call in the partnering boats next to them. As we take on this call and go deeper with the things of God, we're going to be so overwhelmed in a good sense. We're going to call our friends next to us and say, come and help. 